Hello, my name is Mark Gibson, and you're listening to the podcast version of the Chagask Signpost series, a weekly webinar that promotes and examines sustainability in Irish farming. The Water Framework Directive, which is the overarching legislation that governs water quality protection across Europe, uh, sets standards for both the chemical and biological quality of our rivers, lakes, estuaries and coastal waters. In its most recent report on water quality, the Environmental Protection Agency shows a continuing decline in water quality and that more needs to be done to protect our water environment. The main threats they've identified to water quality are are the presence of too much nutrients such as phosphorus, nitrogen and nitrogen, which come primarily from agriculture and wastewater. Chagask, government departments, industry and farmers have come together to work uh, to reduce these, uh, the, the, the impact of, water, of the, the sector on water quality. And I'm delighted to be joined by Eddie Burgess, Catchment Science Specialist with Chagisk, and Noel Meehan, uh, ASAP Program Manager, also with Chagisk, to discuss these programs and the work that's going on in agriculture to reduce its impact on water quality. Good morning, Eddie and uh, Noel. You're very welcome to the Signpost webinar. And we're also joined by Pat Murphy, uh, who's based down in Wexford. Pat, good morning to you. You're, morning. Uh, good morning, Pat. You're, Pat is our head of uh, knowledge transfer on the environment program. So you're all very welcome. So um, Eddie and uh, Eddie, starting with you, you're working on the catchments program. Uh, the catchments program has been in place for a number of years now. Is that right? That's right, Mark. Yeah, we'll, we've been uh, in the same location, six different uh, ca- small catchment areas around the country, monitoring water quality uh, in agriculturally based landscapes. Uh, uh, for we're on the ground, thir- there's equipment on the ground 13 years now. And Noel, uh, if I could turn to you, uh, you you're a program manager of the ASIP program. Uh, could you tell us a little bit, bit about the work you're doing there? Yeah, Mark, um, I suppose we're, we're working with farmers in 190 priority areas for action or priority or catchments around the countryside. We're working in collaboration with, with uh, the dairy industry and with um, our colleagues in Law Pro. And um, we're, we're basically trying to provide a service to farmers, you know, to help them take on board actions or measures that will help improve water quality. Um, as, you, as you indicated, it's, it's, it's not where we want it to be. So look, we're trying to do our best to help farmers on that front. Yeah, no, it's, it's a great example of collaboration and cooperation. So, um, so Eddie, you're going to kick us off today, I think. Uh, so if I could ask you to share your screen with us and uh, to reminder to everybody, if you have a question uh, that you'd like us to put to Eddie or Noel at the end of the presentation, uh, please do send them through to us using the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. So, Eddie, I'll hand over to you. Thanks, Mark. Um, and I suppose before we start, I, I'd just like to acknowledge our funders. Um, the Catchments Programme has been operated by Chagas, but we are 100% funded by the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine, and also in advance, Noel, with the ASAP Programme and, and all their staff are being funded by the Department of Agriculture and the Department of Housing, Local Government and Heritage and their Sustainability Ireland. So i just just like to acknowledge that at, at the outset. But just, just very quickly to give an overview of what the Agriculture Catchments Programme is, um, we are carrying out research and we are also engaging with farmers and trying to uh, get our message out, a knowledge transfer programme. Um, and you can see there on the map where we have our six different catchment areas. Okay. And I said we have equipment on place heading on for 13 years now on the ground or in the river, as in the case may be. Uh, the programme is running a year longer than that. It took us a year to identify the locations and, and the equip, put all the equipment in place. Um, last year, the Department of Agriculture asked us to take on additional role for gaseous emissions. So our staff numbers have increased. We did have 16 and we now have 23 staff working with us. Um, with technicians, researchers, advisors, data recorders and administration staff. Um, but none of this would be possible without the collaboration of the 300 approximately farmers that are managing land across the six catchment areas. Okay. The research is not just on uh, biophysical elements. We're, we're not just looking at water quality, nutrient transfer and soil science. 
We are also doing research and, and trying to elaborate why farmers would change their practice, how much it costs them to implement the regulations and the directive, and what their attitudes are towards the rules. So there's a socioeconomic aspect to it as well. And as I've mentioned, we have a knowledge transfer aspect of it. And I suppose I, um, um, that what I'm doing just now would, would be an example of that. Uh, it's a, unfortunate due to the COVID-19, we can't get out and about and use the catchments as, as focus points, but that will come hopefully in the not too distant future. Uh, the initial reason, and I'd say the main purpose of the programme, but, but, but it's not the sole purpose, is that we are there to evaluate uh, policy and the regulation. And things like the Nitrates Action Plan and its derogation, are being we are evaluating that and contribute to the reports under the Article 10 reporting going back to Brussels. That feeds into the Water Framework Directive, as Mark mentioned, and, and know that unfortunately the trends in the last four years have, have stagnated and started to move in the wrong direction. Um, uh, agricultural production policy under FoodWise is showing increasing intensification or, and, and looking for it. And we're trying to uh, put figures on the term uh, sustainable intensification. And as I mentioned more recently, the Climate Action Plan also is we are now uh, part of, of that, getting into that. So how do we do all this? There is an awful lot of equipment in that in place, and it has been operating, taking uh, uh, very high resolution monitoring every 10 minutes. Um, but what carries the nutrients, the weather has a huge impact, and each of our catchments has a weather station in them, and that data is available for people to see publicly online. We have a monitoring station at the outlet of the catchment, which is taking samples of water, as I mentioned, every 10 minutes and testing it for a number of parameters, nitrogen, phosphorus, uh, total organic carbon, pH, turbidity, so on, every 10 minutes, very high resolution. You can imagine in six catchments, 10 minutes for 13 years and ongoing, there's a lot of figures there and it's, it's been managed in, uh, in, um, in the database in Johnson & Castle, which is also quite complex. And um, we're measuring the volume of water. That's one thing that at the start of the program, I was quite taken back by how much effort is put into measuring the volume of the water. And all this gives us a knowledge of the processes involved in nutrients getting into water and how water quality is being impacted if it is or why it isn't if it's, if it's in good status. But none of this would be possible if we didn't have the collaboration of the farmers in the catchments. Um, and you can imagine they didn't choose to partake in this. And you can imagine that um, they might have been somewhat cautious of a program uh, coming down to evaluate nitrate regulations. And, and how have we engaged with them? And why have they worked with us? And I have to say quite positively that, that they are um, positive about the catchments program. Um, so just to give you an idea of the type of, of findings that we have very briefly. There was a uh, very heavy um, nights or days rain on the last on the 30th of January, the second last day of January this year. And this is an, an example of what happened in Valley View. You see there's a lot of water flowing by there. What does that tell us? Well, first of all, our weather station, we showed that there was 24 millimeters of rainfall. That's these blue bars coming down, showing that heavy rain. And the black line is the flow coming out of the river, how much water is leaving. And you can see the river on Saturday, early Saturday morning, the river went into flood. It didn't stay in flood very long, only maybe six hours, and then it came back down again. It was a very flashy catchment. Um, okay, that, you might say that's obvious, uh, but because we're also measuring the quality at the same time of the water, we can measure the concentration of phosphorus in this water. And not only did we have more water leaving, but every liter of water had more phosphorus in it, a multiple of phosphorus in it, possibly 10 to up to 10 times more phosphorus per liter at the peak from when we we're looking at the base flow back here. And if you multiply the concentration by the volume, we get a figure for how much phosphorus left, the load of nutrient that left. And that flood event 
only about 10 hours of rain, carried a total of 132 kilograms of phosphorus out of the catchment. And if we compare that to what we have got on average over the previous 11 years, actually 10% of the phosphorus left in that one rainfall event. And we can do these calculations over the year or for particular rainfall events or for the closed period. And it gives us a knowledge of the impact of different seasons, different farm practices, um, our, our different influences of weather. And, th and this is what we do in the Catch This program. It's our bread and butter. Um, so uh, while there is 10% coming out there in, in a peak flood, I and mean, we need to target things like that, I'm not saying that that isn't of significance, the concentration at low flow during maybe the summer months um, um, is equally important. A flush out of nutrient over a one day period, the nutrients come, they increase and they're gone out and the Ballycanoe catchment is close to the sea in Core Town and phosphorus in salty water isn't a nutrient of concern. So maybe that isn't have a big impact. What is having a larger impact in situations like that is the concentration when the river is in that base flow at, at normal low level rivers. And under the water framework directive, if the water body is to be classified as high status, the concentration of phosphorus should be below 0 0.025. And if it's to be good, it should be below 0 0.035. Um, and if these are exceeded in base flow conditions, it will probably have a bigger impact on ecology than the big flush out event that I just showed you. In the Ballycanoe catchment, the soil tests has shown us that the soil is naturally, or well, not naturally, it is very low in soil P, and the farmers are not applying very much phosphorus. They're applying a lot less than what, what they're allowed to apply in, in the catchment. So you would expect that there is a low source of P being applied. You would expect in low flow um, that the levels of phosphorus in the river would be quite low. Unfortunately, that is not the case. And Sarah Vera did some work um, a number of years ago, uh, and she compared the average annual concentration, which was 0 0.076, double what it should be. Now, this is total P. Um, um, but she also took samples upstream and noticed that in the spring, the levels were lowest. In the summer, they had increased to quite a high level, and in autumn, they had dropped back again. And this was at 40 or 50 sampling points moving upstream. And she also noticed that actually the concentrations got more increased as you moved further downstream. And this is kind of an indication that there may be other sources feeding into it, point sources feeding into it, and the concentration building up as you moved further down. Uh, another contrasting or kind of ironic thing, and I spoke of this, about this in my previous presentation, was comparing the Castle Dockerel catchment a free draining soil in County Wexford in the tillage area with the Timolee catchment in County Cork, also free draining but intensive dairying. Um, it's just our castle dock where it's arable and slate and Timolee is mostly dairying and a sandstone base. Um, you would expect the nitrate problem to be much higher in Timolee because there is a much higher organic nitrogen loading and probably twice as high a chemical uh, loading. And we have groundwater wells sampling water in these catchments to get an understanding of the below ground water transfer pathway with three bores on each, each slope. But the results have shown us that the hill slopes in the Castle Dockerel catchment have half the nitrogen, sorry, have twice the nitrogen leaving in comparison to the one that has three times the, the nitrogen loading. I'm just going to say that again, I was getting a bit tongue twisted there. The results have shown us that the hill slope would almost triple the nitrogen loading on the surface of the land as less than half the nitrate leaving in the stream. So why do we have such contradictions taking place? It doesn't always follow what you would expect. And quite simply, factors that affecting water quality are complex. They're contrasting. Nitrogen and phosphorus quite often 
contrast to each other. But the three things that impact on them, farm practice does impact on them. There's no doubt farm practice uh, has an impact. And you would generally expect that the higher the load of nutrient being applied, the greater the risk of that nutrient being lost. And across the country, the EPA have shown that through monitoring of many, many more catchment areas than we have that, that to be the case. Soil type and weather are also hugely important factors impacting on what water quality is. And what one farmer does on a free draining soil type could have a major impact and that someone on a high clay content soil, that would, would be irrelevant. And in a very dry, hot summer, you're likely to have maybe problems with nitrogen. And if we have a summer like 2012, where it rained all summer, then maybe that won't be the case. So really what I'm saying is one size does not fit all. It's a term that we have heard many times, but the, the, the result of that is that we need to be very clued in when we're selecting actions to try and mitigate the impact. And to do that, we need a very good understanding of the processes involved uh, in nutrients getting into the water. And if we're working as an advisor with farmer trying to give them, we need to understand these. And if we want a farmer to take on these additional actions, they also need to know why. And the policymakers, both in the Department of Housing and the Department of Agriculture and in Brussels, also need to have a good understanding of the processes involved and, and in the EPA. But again, it is crucial that the people working on the ground need to have an appreciation and an understanding of why these rules are being put in place. Otherwise, there will be resentment and they'll feel that they're only curtailing their uh, activities and their livelihoods. Um, and with this in mind, and I think the whole purpose of Water Week is to try and, and come up and um, resolve this, it is very easy to oversimplify the issues that are, are causing problems in our water, especially if you don't have the knowledge of the processes involved. A small bit of knowledge can be a dangerous thing. So how did we get the farmers to engage with us in the catchments program and across the country to a greater extent, and hopefully this will continue. But I, a lot of the actions that we're asking people to do to improve water quality have other multifunctional benefits. An example of this would have been good nutrient management planning. It's taken soil samples, um, I think was the single biggest factor um, when I was working as an advisor with the catchments program, going out to the farmers in Wexford with soil results and explaining the um, nutrient, sitting down at the kitchen table and explaining the, the nutrient status of their soils with them. It was the single biggest factor that encouraged them to buy into the agricultural catchment program. Particularly so in the tillage catchment, in the grassland catchment, uh, when we did repeat samples and looked at fertility trends, I think they, they, were, they brought into it. But also, uh, good water quality will improve, generally coincides with good working conditions and a sense of pride on your farm at home. Other motivational factors would be that um, we are very significantly a food exporting country. And a lot of our main agricultural systems export 80 to 90% of what's being produced. And we market our food on a green image. And if water quality trends and gaseous emissions uh, and so forth are moving in the wrong direction, it will be difficult to stand over these green credentials. And farmers are aware of this um, and, and, and are keen to hold on to that green image and try and, and boost their markets as much as possible. Equally, we have regulations coming on top of us, and I think it, it, it's not any coincidence that the dairy industry are concerned about the derogation in the nitrates directive. And as a result, when, when I'm giving talks, I notice that if I'm talking to a group of intensive dairy farmers, they tend to be a lot more uh, interested and clued in than, um, than other sectors of, the, of, of, of agriculture that are probably not as dependent on the derogation. But the nitrates directive, applies to all sectors and, and um, it will evolve and be modified and, and amended every four years. There also are environmental schemes that increase motivation. Um, but finally, I have to say that any mitigation actions that are being encouraged or enforced 
They need to work. If the wrong action is put in place and it curtails production or output or someone's income, and it doesn't have an impact on water quality, then we all lose credibility. And there have been examples and cases of that. Um, I know a number of years back, there was very significant buffer margins put in Denmark and a lot of land was taken out of production, but Denmark is a very free draining soil type and most of the water courses were fed by groundwater and a large buffer margin didn't do anything to stop nitrates feeding the springs that, that fed the rivers. So that was an example of a mitigation action that, that was ineffective and was in the wrong place. Okay, I'm going to hand over to Noel um, who, who, who's working with the ASA program. I'm going to stop sharing and, and hopefully I'll, I'll let, let Noel take over. Okay, thanks, thanks, Eddie. And uh, you, you, you wound up your presentation there with some, uh, you know, a statement that I think uh, uh, will be probably reused after today. If we don't have the right, uh, you know, the science behind the actions that we're proposing, uh, and that they're, they're, you know, we can't prove that they, they work effectively. Um, and while while we're impacting on potentially impacting on, on farmers' incomes and so forth, you know that that really is crucial, and that's why it's so important that we have the the catchments program there, testing those those measures, uh, testing the effectiveness of them. So, uh, Noel, you're all teed up there, ready to go. So we'll hand over to you, and uh, we will talk to you afterwards. You've about uh, fifteen minutes, Noel. Yeah. Okay, Mark. Um, thanks, Eddie. So, look, just. Um... I suppose just to give a, maybe a little bit of background as to what the ASAP is, uh, like Eddie, I'm sure some of you will know what it is and others won't. And um, I suppose it's, it stands for the Agricultural Sustainability Support and Advisory Programme. And we work with farmers in 190 uh, priority areas for actions or PAs. Um, our job is to provide a confidential a free uh, um, and, and free advisory service to farmers in those inside those uh, 190 PAs with tw 20 Chagas Contendary Advisors, and we work very closely with Law Pro, the Local Authorities Waters Programme. And why are we here? We're here because um, by 2027, <coughs> under the Water Framework Directive, Ireland is supposed to have uh, all waters at at least good status by 2027. And um, for those who, who mightn't be aware, I, you're all aware of, of kind of the star rating for hotels. So you're looking at uh, four star water, four or five star water is what we need. Um, anything below that is is uh, is not meeting the target. So that's what good status means. So Law Pro provides the catchment science. They 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 are the experts um, in identifying what the pressures and what the what the issues are. Um, and if uh, agriculture is, is identified as a pressure in uh, PAA, well then that's where we come in. We we uh, go and engage with the farmers in and we offer them uh, an advisory service on that. And I suppose why. Why Water Quality Week? Um, I suppose the reason is is that we, we've learned a lot from uh, from Law Pro and from our engagement with farmers. And what we're trying to do is to bring those learnings to the wider farmer and industry uh, audience, and and you know try and get those messages out there. So that's that's what the, the idea behind Water Quality Week was. So um, I suppose just a little bit of information on ASAP. Um, we have. Completed just uh, 1,810 farm assessments nationally to the end of December with uh, follow up visits to 391 of those. And I suppose no more than any other sector of society, um, the ASAP has been uh, affected by um, uh, the COVID 19 restrictions quite severely in the last 12 months. So um, we've had great engagement by farmers. 96% of farmers have engaged with us. And you know we've identified an awful lot of issues across all the farms of varying levels of severity or, or or problem, uh, degree of problems, and uh, 10,000, just over 10,000 of those. And the average number of issues per farm identified is, is six. Um, what pressures or what's, the, what's impacting on, on the rivers uh, and the water bodies out there? Well, um, just over, just under three quarters of the, the, the water bodies are impacted by diffuse losses. And when I talk about diffuse losses, I talk about phosphorus, sediment, uh, and nitrogen and diffuse losses are at a, a kind of a farm or a field scale um, where you have um, you know a, a drip feed across a, a wide area um, I suppose it's, it's, it's the exact opposite of what a point source is where you have just a pipe or whatever um, 
point source loss, I think you're very familiar with those. So the fuse is at a, is at a field or a farm scale. Uh, and those are you know, nearly three quarters of what the problems are out there. And um, I suppose just to give a, an idea of, of what we were finding, we have various, we have a way of tracking the level of implementation across um, by the farmers. And I suppose we'll get into the, the maybe the ongoing one is, is, is um, one where there's, there's practice change need over, over a sustained period of time. And I'll go through that a little bit. So that's most of them are ongoing, but we have a, a, lot, of, a lot of work to do with getting some measures started and going and, and look at, we haven't been out on farms for since, you know, September, uh, October because of lockdown. So there could have been work done that we just haven't been able to pick up yet. So we have to keep an eye on that and, and try and get as many measures as we can implemented to their to their full. Um, so just, uh, I'm not going to stay on this one because the rest of the presentation is, is actually going through all these issues. So these are the kind of the, the main 15 issues that we're, we're finding out there. And they're across, um, you know, nutrient management planning issues, they're across land management issues, and they're across farmyards. And I suppose, you know, the, the most frequent one is the phosphorus loss through overland flow. That's the one that keeps coming up mostly, and then, and then uh, as, they, as they go along down there. So I'm just going to give you a, a flavor for what, what they are. So nutrient management issues, we're talking about, um, you know, when organic fertilizer and when chemical fertilizer is spread. And that is very that that is really important from a from a diffuse loss point of view because um, what you have is at the shorter periods of the year you have a greater chance of nutrient being lost and the reason you have a greater chance of nutrient being lost is because uh, generally the winters are uh, winter autumn winter spring that's when you get your heaviest rainfall events as, as Eddie showed in his video a while ago you have a greater chance of soil being saturated or water moving through soil profile. Um, it's also the coldest time of the year, so crops aren't growing. You know, if they're not growing, they're not taking up nutrient, and that nutrient, if it's not being taken up by a crop, is available to be lost. And uh, so the growth rates are low, and 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 then you obviously have the weather forecast. You know, you're, as I said, you're more likely to get those winter storms and those high periods of storms, or high high periods. So, you know, we 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 put a lot of focus into talking to farmers and explaining why it's important to be very aware of. The weather when you're putting out your when you're when you're using your nutrients particularly um in that january february march period and also in that september october period when you're allowed to, to, to buy nutrients and the science backs it up um eddie's team there have, have produced a really good paper by um, ray chore who's actually part of the of law pro uh, currently and you know a disproportionately high level of nutrient loss occurs during the close period 43% of P and 45% of N. And, and Eddie's example there, that, that when they gave her 10% uh, of P was lost in one storm event. You know, that, that's, if you have three or four of those, that's your, that's your, your loss of P from a catchment. So it's very important that, you know, I know a lot of people may feel the closed periods are, are, are a calendar farm is something that they, they are not fond of, but, um, you know, they do have, uh, they are there for a reason and, uh, you know, uh, where they are, uh, Questions. I think this kind of a science really, really backs up the, the reason for them being there. Um, so other nutrient management issues all around nutrient uh, uh, nutrient management planning and you know identifying the right fields uh, where there's nutrient deficits and applying them appropriately as opposed to you know um, loading them in around the, the the farmyard or close to the farm where uh, you know you could have uh, index four soils. And also lime, and uh, lime is very important for improving the, the nutrient use efficiency. So, you know, if, if, if your lime is right, you know, it, release, it releases um, phosphorus K, it makes your, the, the end that you apply uh, uptake more efficiently. So it's very important that, that we have the nutrient management plan and that we implement it because too often they get just thrown in the drawer and, and ignored. And again, then look at just going back to the weather, um, you know, you have heavy rainfall and issues like that. They're all tied in. You know, if you, if you, if you have a situation where, uh, you know, too much fertilizer goes, the slurry goes out at the wrong time of the year and you have, and you have weather, weather like that, you know, it's, it's, it's not going to end in, in, a, in a good place, you know. So just to make farmers aware that sometimes it might be dry when, and the ground might be trafficable when you're going out. But if there's, if there's a, a week's rain forecast, you know, you need to maybe think twice or, or need to get out, just drop it a foot or two as opposed to uh, emptying a full tank, things like that. Um, so then just look at the farmyards, um, you know, clean and grey water management, uh, dirty yards, you know, I think most farmers know about this and, and everybody's very clear on what, what, what they are. I suppose the silage pits, and, um, you know, just need to be careful with, with uh, maybe the expansion that's gone on in dairy and that 
the uh, the corresponding increases in size and, and tidy slabs hasn't occurred, and, and there has been a number of and instances where um, pits have split and too much gone into them, and, and effluent get escaping because channels aren't being kept clear and things like that. So trying to point those issues out to farmers and, and you know make sure that they're they're sound structurally sound as well. Um, you know, this is your classic point source, uh, you know, where there might be a drain that, you know, can convey effluent or can convey soil water that those need to be uh, need to be blocked off and, and the effluent captured and, and, and treated properly. And, you know, um, they, they do occur, unfortunately. And again, I suppose the slurry storage one is, is another one due to expansion. Uh, a lot of anecdotal evidence out there around, uh, around um, you know, not being enough slurry storage. Uh, if you don't have enough slurry storage, it means that you, you're going to have to go out in periods of the year where the weather isn't appropriate and, you know, that can lead to its own problem. So, you know, it's important that, um, you know, I think it's a good opportunity you now for, for farmers, um, you know, listen online there are advisors that's listening online that, you know, you sit down once the cabin is over or maybe the BPS is over, sit down and, and have, a, have a good look at what you're doing in the, in the farmyard, especially if you're after expanding them in the recent years. Um, a lot of what we're doing is trying to reiterate um, good practice around the regulations that's already there with regards to buffers, but you'd be surprised how many people don't actually know the, the buffers for, for slurry and, and that they, they go from 5 to 10 metres in, in October and, and January, you know, if you are putting out. So we need, to, we need to start applying buffers much more, you know, that, there's a river just along the side here and that's getting, being offered great protection. And, you know, you're looking at probably 10 or 12 metres of protection there where the slurry is. So any rainfall and, and overland flow that occurs there is going to be captured by the buffer. Um, there's regulations in now about farm roads and for, for all farmers. So look at, I think everybody that has a farm road alongside the stream needs to uh, have a look at it and see if they need to make any adjustments or changes to it. Um, you know, again, regulations around drinking points for derogation farmers, um, sometimes they are impacting. Um, you know, it's, it's certainly having cattle in a stream is, isn't going to isn't going to improve water quality, but sometimes they more some impact more than others. But uh, it's important to, that we address them. And I suppose the the uh, the big one that's coming up, uh, particularly around the south and, and east, is is, in, is the diffuse nitrogen leaching from light soils. And there are maps out there called pit maps. And I know um, Jenny Deacon from the EPA is coming up at the end of at the end of April. And I think she'll be talking about the new generation pit maps that's coming out, but they are going to be used to help identify where you have these free draining soils that, that could uh, disproportionately impact on, um, on, uh, on nitrogen leaching. So it's about putting the right fertilizer at the right time, right rate, right location, right product. Okay, so I'll come back to the first one I mentioned, which was the, which was the phosphorus loss and, and overland flow. And you know this usually this generally occurs on the heavier soils. So phosphorus loss is is, is an issue, uh, and sediment loss is an issue on, on the heavier soils, whereas nitrogen is an issue on the free draining soils. And the reason why phosphorus is, a lot, is an issue on the heavy soils is because those, the, when when you have heavy rainfall, those soils get saturated much quicker. And any surface, uh, any chemical fertilizer or, 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 or uh, P that's that's available on the surface and the phosphorus that binds tightly to the soil particles or the soil sediment that can be washed off, um, those start to move across the surface of the ground and, and end up getting washed into the into the drainage net. So you know you have a situation like this where you have a, a large field that probably was you know four or five fields at one stage, but the ditches have gone, uh, the water moving down, landed in this kind of a, a wet area that obviously the farmer thought was you know he couldn't uh, set a crop in because it's too wet. And you have this issue where water starts to flow over. So there's no protection there for that water body uh, from the soil getting, getting washed into it. So, you know, you're, you're probably looking at this area here as a kind of a critical area that something needs to be done. And, and even back up here, what can we do to, to, to uh, slow the water down from getting, getting to, to the stream? So um, if you were to take a, an aerial photograph of that and, and maybe, you know, look at the way the water flows over the surface, you have these kind of preferential flow paths or, or channels that are there. And, and these, again, um, not to try and, 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 and jump ahead of Jenny Deacon, these are new maps that the EPA have, have developed. And I know Jenny will go into a lot more detail about these in a couple of weeks, but just to, to make the point that, you know, there are points in the landscape like that where water uh, is, is delivered into, into um, the fields. This is the overland flow that I'm talking about here. And, and obviously the redder the color, the more volume of water that 
that can end up in, into the stream. So you have these entry points here. So, you know, this is where um, the focus needs to be put by the likes of ourselves uh, for the farmers to, to take on measures to uh, prevent the access of, of, of nutrient and sediment, like what's happening in this picture on the left into the stream network. And as I said, those are new um, focus towards every zone maps. Don't worry about the name, but they, they, these are new maps that DPA have developed. So I, I know Ginny wrote a lot of detail, but just to just to give an example of what we could be doing here. So, you know, the picture that Eddie showed earlier on with the video, you know, quite a volume of water coming down there. Um, you know, so how do we how do we maybe manage that in a, in a better way? And, and this maybe one coming down the middle here is, is an example. So I think what we need to do is, is to try and, and slow the flow down. As Eddie said, that was a quite a flashy catchment. Obviously, it's well, it's it's highly drained. So Valley Canoe. So you know, maybe you need to. This isn't Valley Canoe, by the way, but you need to maybe look at trying to slow the water down. You need to put in something like maybe hedgerows, or you put in kind of low earthen mounds or buns. You know, just just to to slow the water down and 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 maybe trap it for 24 hours and then maybe release it slowly after the peak of the rain has passed. You know, you could look at uh, maybe putting in some woodlands for water, where where basically you, you're you're Trying to um, put in some woody habitat that again will, you know, hopefully slow it down, improve infiltration, stabilize, and uh, capture some nutrients at, at that point. Um, you know, maybe all this drainage has caused uh, the water to speed up, which in, in in turn is causing erosion of banks. So there might be need for some some riverbank supports. You know, um, improving debris or, or rock armoring or something like that. Um, there may be an opportunity to put in, in a wet, small wetland pond that will have benefit uh, as well from maybe potentially nitrate, but also from a biodiversity greenhouse gas area. And then you're looking at sediment, sediment traps or leaky dams. Again, the idea is to slow the water down, to trap the sediment, to let the sediment settle out, let the phosphorus settle, settle out. So those are the kind of things that um, we, we could be talking to with farmers. But I suppose, you know, it's all new. Um, it goes above and beyond what is in the regulations that, that are there at the minute. And as well as that, you know, ASAP, we're, 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 we're coming, talking to farmers and, and relying on their goodwill. There is no um, funding like what would be in the EIPs for this kind of stuff, you know. So we don't have the funding behind it to pay farmers to put these in things in or to incentivize farmers to put these things in. So um, look, at it, it, it is, it is uh, there are options there. And I suppose the job, our job is to try and, and get as many of these kind of things implemented in the suitable location. So we're trying to really put the right measure in the right place to, to uh, prevent water or to prevent nutrient sediment loss. So look, just to summarize there, because I know we're, we're getting getting late and markets probably sweating there a little bit, but um, the overall summary is that water quality is declining. Uh, you know, the main issues are diffuse P sediment in losses and point source are still an issue. Um, it's all about the soil, soil type, the weather and farm practice. So when you com combine all those three, they all are influencing water quality and, and you won't solve one without taking, uh, you won't solve Work out issue without dealing with all three of those. And what we really need is, is the mitigation actions that we're recommending for farmers that need to be implemented and maintained over a period of time to improve water quality. That's the message that I want to get out there that we, we need to get these implemented or we want some improvement in water quality. Um, so just to finish up and, and just, uh, just from uh, Water Quality Week, there's a number of people that I just want to do a quick thank you to because I think it'd be uh, Water Quality Week didn't just happen. There was an awful lot of work that went on behind the scenes. and the advisors in the asset program from both Chagas and Co-op uh, have done a lot of work and Law Pro as well have come on board and, and took over them a day for us. So thanks to all those. I'd like to thank the ACP and the researchers in Johnstown Castle, um, Eddie and his team, and, and, and down in Johnstown Castle as well, the researchers down there and the, the guys that helped with the video editing across the, the Chagas organization. Our PR team have done an excellent job in, in getting the message out there. Uh, and I just want to also thank um, Yvonne Maher, She's uh, our colleague on the ASA program and she's worked tirelessly there behind the scenes and uh, making sure that all the content was, was available and, and in the correct order and ready to go uh, for each day. Um, you know, the work late into the evening, making sure that the website was updated this week. So I think it, it has run very smoothly and a lot of that credit for that uh, needs to go to go on. So with that, Mark, I'll, I'll wrap it up there. Thank you, Noel. Um, and um, I just want to say congratulations to you and all of the, the people who were involved in uh, Water Week. Um, there's a huge amount of uh, content has been created for the social media channels, but also the Chagas website. I think there's a really 
excellent resource uh, there now available for anybody who is interested in uh, finding out these, in, in particular, the, the fact sheets, I think, are excellent, the ASAP uh, fact sheets that are available. So if anybody wants to find out more about that, you can go to the chagisk.ie and there's a link there on the homepage that will bring you directly to all of the, the resources that are available on uh, the uh, Water Quality Week. So, so well done on that. So uh, we've lots of questions coming through here, so uh, we, we won't uh, hang about too long. But I just wanted to just to just to tease out that figure there. The uh, Noel, you mentioned uh, the 96 percent engagement uh, from farmers. Surely that shows us that there is an appetite there amongst farmers to do the right thing. Yeah, um, look, I think it's, you know, maybe to wind it back a small little bit. Um, and we'll say, you know, the, the, the original, the, the first river basin management plan and, you know, the review that went on there and, you know, um, I suppose the second river basin management plan learned from, from the first and adopted a far more consultative, far more engagement, far more collaborative approach. And, um, you know, where as opposed to going with regulation and, 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 um, you know, inspections and so on. They said, "Look, at, you know, we need to we need to start engaging with farmers at, at a different level, and we need to start bringing in an advisory service." Uh, and look, at, I think it's it's credit to the departments and the EPA for recognizing that and, and for putting steps in place. So, look, I think it's 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 um it's part of that and part of the good work by the advisors as well, because you know, um, we're walking in the off off the road pretty much with a little bit of, of, of you know there wouldn't necessarily be the advisor that would be dealing with normally so in credit course the advisors as well that they're able to build up a rapport and, and explain what they're about and and get farmer engagement look at it it is quite high and um, i i kind of expect it maybe to come back a little bit because you know to be to be uh, straight up about it you know the co-op advisors are going to their co-op clients so you'd expect that that would have a good a good in, good uh, strike rate there. Ourselves have been, you know, working with Chagas clients, but also non-Chagas clients, but it's only more recently that we'll be getting the non-Chagas clients due to GDPR issues. We didn't know who they were, so now we're engaging with those. So look, it may come back a little bit, but I don't expect it to, to bottom off front like that, but, um, you know, it, it is really good. And I think the farm orgs have come behind us really, really well as well, and they've bought into it really well and um, helped uh, you know, we alleviate any fears uh, about the program to their membership. So, you know, look, at, I think it's it's definitely the whole collaborative thing where where we've engaged have, has uh, paid dividends in that in that front. Had some some good questions coming through there. Yep, uh, I suppose some on the technical side. One, a, a couple of questions for Eddie in relation to the the uh, tests and the, the importance of the, the high resolution, the high speed testing, the, the 10 minutes relative to, I suppose, more periodic testing. And then another question in relation to what are the key tests as indicators of water quality? Yeah, um, yeah very good, very good questions and, 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 and uh, quite, quite simple questions, but, 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 but to the nub of it. I, 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 I could give a rhetorical question, um, what tests are needed for water quality? What is water quality? What do you mean by water quality? Is it safe to drink? Drinking water quality is different from an ecological status water quality. Um, the ecological status in our estuaries is impacted by nitrogen and the standard for nitrogen in our estuaries is 2.6 milligrams per litre. The drinking water standard is four times higher than that. It's 11.3. Um, on the on the nitrate nitrogen uh, measuring, which is the equivalent of fifty milligrams of nitrate, um, it, for for the uh, um, I think another question there is asking: Are are we looking at uh, microbial uh, interaction? Like drinking water standard would be looking at E. coli and and the other types of things that would make make it unsafe for you to drink with. We're not looking at those as a water quality type issue. Um, but I suppose from the water framework directive, um, there, there's nutrient status and the two nutrients that we're concerned with are nitrate and phosphorus. Uh, and they're different for, as I mentioned, for ecological status or for uh, drinking water status. But uh, at, the, at the end of the day, I think the vast majority of water bodies that are not reaching the status are not uh, for the water framework directive 
are falling down on the ecological status of the, of, of the river, which is assessed through a kick sample and looking at diatoms and the life living in the riverbed. And the frequency that we carry out that in the catchments is twice a year. Um, and we look when we compare it between the summer and the spring. Um, and sorry, an autumn, spring, spring and autumn um, um, ecological status, and, and that's not needed at the same level. But coming back to the question, doing it every 10 minutes, that gives us a very detailed understanding of the processes involved. Um, and we wouldn't be able to calculate the loads of nutrient leaving, particularly with uh, point sources and flashy events like phosphorus. Nitrate concentrations don't vary to the same extent as what we would have seen uh, in the graph that I showed earlier on there, and possibly a uh, lower resolution would, would be sufficient there. But I'd be cautious saying that, as I mentioned, a small bit of knowledge is a dangerous thing, and I'd, I'd refer you to our researchers more on that. Uh, I suppose one more question, a uh, question uh, aimed at Noel. Uh, how do you navigate with farmers who are upstream and, and don't see the impact of, of their practices? Uh, they may be missing uh, a sense of pride and it's just a, a case of, of where, uh, where is the impact identified and, and how do you deal with it? It's, it's not all about the, the last few farmers in the, in the catchment. Can I come in on that one, Pat? Sorry, before, yeah. before, before Noel comes in there. I, I think that's a very, very good question. Um, our main, and, and I'm coming back to the graph I showed of Sarah Vero's work with the Synoptic Survey, where she took 50 samples moving upstream in the river. Our main outlet, taking 10 samples, or sorry, taking samples every 10 minutes, is at the outlet of the catchment. And there's 40 farmers in the catchment. And there is other activity going on in the catchment. There's wastewater treatment facilities from villages, from schools, and, and more. Um, and if any one of those is, is out of line. It, it could undo all the excellent practice that has been done by the majority of people working in that catchment. And that could demotivate uh, people to, um, to uh, do a good job. Uh, it, and, and often, there, I, what I like about the Water Framework Directive is it's trying to have a whole community approach and bring everyone together. And I think if we start uh, putting one sector of either one sector of agriculture against another sector or one sector of society against another. We're not going to achieve good water quality and we need to work together to do that. And that is not easy. And it, um, farmers will often complain about municipal wastewater treatment plant facilities not doing a good job. And there are, we know there are places in the country that don't have wastewater treatment facilities. And if you're a farmer in one of those catchments, you're not going to be so keen to, to spread your story on time. You say, what's the point? Someone else upstream is doing it. Or if you have a neighbor who's a farmer who, is, who has bad practice, uh, you, you won't be as motivated. Equally, um, the example I often take is tillage farmers in a Thai in County Kildare. It's not a county known for sailing. It doesn't have a coastline. But tillage is known for causing nitrogen uh, it's, it's nitrogen risky. It doesn't cause that problem until it gets to the estuary and when you get out to sea. And it's difficult to try and uh, encourage farmers in a location where the impact is not on their doorstep. That's why we have something like Water Week. No, you might address it in, in how the, I suppose, Law Pro and, and ASAP are working together in, in that kind of full length of the catchment. Yeah, yeah, I, could, I think Eddie admitted it spoke very well there. Um, but I suppose just from from the from the asset point of view, um, you know, by and large, what we're where we're working it would be in the you know the headwaters of uh, of catchments. Now, it's not exclusively the case, and and that is that is a problem exactly as the person has asked that you know. Uh, we could be in one water body, but this is actually the water body that's upstream that's impacting, and, and we're not working there yet. But that would be fixed uh, in the second, in the third river basin management plan. If 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 we're all rolled over to that, um, that they're looking at, at at moving upstream. So what we're trying to do is 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 work from the headwaters down along, so as that you fix the headwaters and and make sure that the water from the headwaters is is of a good status, and then you come down the next 
explore the next water body and you're trying to fix that and you work it down towards the towards the estuary. So it's a, it's a methodical from the top down kind of approach. And you're right, like we have noticed that in, in, in Law Pro have noticed that in that, you know, where they haven't picked the headwaters um, or maybe a water body down or two down along the, the river network, they find that it's been impacted from above. And we can't do anything about that at currently, but that hopes, hopefully would be resolved with our river basin management. And we, we add those in as we as well. Eddie, can I ask you a question there in relation to uh, slurry spreading? Uh, one of the viewers here acknowledge, he's acknowledging the that the the interactions there between soil and nutrients are, are complex and often difficult to understand. But uh, he's saying here also that there is a closed period and um, that farmers should not spread on waterlogged or frozen lands, uh, but yet that these uh, practices in some instances are still occurring. Uh, and, and sometimes on derogation farms, this is uh, re, uh, viewer is, is saying here. Um, so why are these simple practices not being adhered to? I suppose that's a, uh, the question here. And how can we expect to retain the derogation if this continues? So I suppose the question, and look, it's for both of you, really, but I mean, there is a, a minority of farmers that we know that are, conti you know, continue to, to spread slurry in unsuitable conditions. Yeah, there is. Um, and, and it's frustrating. Um, and every four years and, and more recently, uh, every two years, the nitrates regulations are being reviewed. Um, and it is difficult to say that we need to review them if the current regulations are not being applied across the board, because not only do we have a closed period, we also have a storage requirement, which is um, some weeks longer than the closed period. And we're not meant to be spreading when heavy rain is forecast or when soil conditions are unacceptable. So if, if uh, there's heavy rain coming on, on the... 1st of February, depending on what part of the country you're in, or on the uh, 14th of, of January, uh, our soils are saturated at that time. If, if you have complied with the regulations, you should have sufficient storage to keep you uh, from having to spread land uh, on such time. But unfortunately, um, there are uh, cases where people don't have sufficient storage. And if your tanks are full, um, you're going to have to get out and spread. Uh, and, and that is impacting on water quality and our monitoring has shown that there is a disproportionately high load of nutrient leaving during the closed period in the winter months when soils are saturated. Uh, and I see there's also a query there saying why um, October uh, isn't, um, isn't uh, closed and, uh, and isn't opened and January closed, sorry. And, and Again, this is the contrast between nitrogen and phosphorus. If we had an exceptionally dry period during the closed period and you were on a pre-draining soil type and the water table had dropped, from a phosphorus point of view, spreading slurry during the closed period wouldn't cause a problem in that scenario. Now, I'm not saying that people should go out and spread it then because slurry also contains plenty of other nutrients. It's a good source of potash, which, is, which it should dictate where it goes, but it's also a good source of nitrogen. And spreading slurry in October really means that you're kissing goodbye to the nitrogen that's in that. If you're kissing goodbye to that nitrogen, you're wasting money. And this is the mutual benefits that I'm, I'm trying to talk about. But, but you're also, if you're going to lose it, it's either going to go into the water or into the atmosphere. And at that time of the year, the likely route is it's going to go into the groundwater. And we need to think of both, from a water quality point of view, we think it, need to think of both nitrogen and phosphorus, and they contrast to each other. Okay, thanks, Ty Tying them in together can confuse uh, the choice of action. Noel, have you any comments on that? Um, yeah, look at it. So maybe go, go back to what I said uh, during the presentation there. I think, you know, it, it's, it's becoming uh, less, uh, I, I think farmers need to have that maybe have expanded in the recent past, uh, need to sit down with their advisor 
and do up a proper audit of their farm with regards to slurry storage and silage pits if they need bigger silage pits and their dairy wash and their soil water and all those other kind of things and you know take an opportunity to try and rectify that um, as soon as you can because it is leading it's leading to problems okay you know you're, you're under pressure straight away during the winter period and you, and you know you're you're asking contractors or to put slurry out when you shouldn't be putting it out and we know that is it is impacting on water quality either through a nitrate leaching issue in, in the more free draining areas or you know phosphorus loss through over on flow like what we've explained so i think my advice would be to to advisors that that are listening in or farmers that are listening and you know sit down with with your with your client or sit down with your advisor and do a do a serious audit and look to try and rectify those problems because you know the 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 industry is very much in the spotlight at the minute and i think we all it's all it's incumbent on all of us to try and um you know put forward industry in the best light that we can and um, these kind of things don't do the industry any favors and we need to you know it's it's it's, it's the law it's the regulations we need to comply and i, I would strongly encourage farmers to, to engage uh, with their with their advisor or, or likewise the advisor to contact Farmers that they know might that might have expanded and to and to ask them to, to consider improving their facilities. So. A question there, just asking about uh, well, it says uh, what two things can farmers do to improve water quality, and what two things can can regulators uh, do to to effectively improve water quality? Um, I I know I've answered this question before by saying, well, listen, you can't pick the two things for farmers because it depends on, on where they are. But no, although I might get you to, to, to comment. Yeah, well, look, I, I think uh, it, you're right. It's, it depends on if you're a phosphorus, if you're a phosphorus kind of risky area, so that's your heavier soils. Those maps that, that I showed you earlier on where we can see those, those focused delivery pathways, they're on their way. Uh, I know there's a question there when they're going to be out. EPA are working really hard to get them out. There's technical issues there at the minute because of the sheer size of, the, of these maps, it's very difficult to get a platform that can that can uh, show these to people. So that's what's delaying it. But I know Ginny Deacon, Ginny Deacon is coming on at the end of the month and she she will have more updated that for, for that question. So I would use those maps to identify those critical source areas, those critical points where water is moving across your feet, your land and delivering nutrient and sediment into the streams. And I would come up with a plan in conjunction with your advisor or ASTEP advisor, whoever it is, to, to, to do something about that to minimize those losses. That's the first thing you do. And the nitrogen side of it, I would start looking really seriously at my slurry storage, my nutrient use in the shoulder periods of the year. So that uh, September, October, right through um, uh, January, February, March period, that you, you, you become really, really aware of what the weather forecast is, the soil temperature, the soil moisture deficit, um, you know, that kind of thing. That, that'll go a long way to improving um, Proven water quality. I suppose from a regulator point of view, I, I would suggest that maybe you know the regulations are there. If we if 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 we if we had better application of those or, or compliance of those, it may reduce a lot a lot of the issues that are that are out there. I don't know whether bring us all the way, but I think it would help bring us a certain a, a lot closer to where we need to be. Okay, um, we we really get really tight on time. I don't know where that hour went. Uh, there are some lovely questions that uh, are coming through that uh, we just don't have time to, to deal with today but uh, maybe we could we could catch up on those again uh, because I know there's some questions around pristine you know uh, uh, high quality waters in uplands that I think uh, needs to be discussed as well but maybe we, we might bring that up with with Jenny Deacon the next day. Um, before we go I just want to let you know that we do have our, a new April schedule announced and next week, uh, we'll be speaking to Helen Sheridan and uh, Tommy Boland from UCD about multi-species swords. And just to note that next week's webinar will take place next Thursday morning, the 1st of April, because of uh, Good Friday. And you can see the rest of the lineup for uh, April on our website. Uh, for example, we'll be talking to uh, Tom Houlihan and Kevin Black uh, around climate mitigation options through forestation on the 9th of April. So there's a full lineup there available. Uh, Noel and Eddie, thank you so much for excellent presentations. And uh, you, you got some tough questions along the way there. Um, no doubt we were, we're going to have to, to, to address this topic again because of such uh, interest. 
Um, I think one group that we didn't mention was maybe the agricultural contractors. And I think that's a group that we could work with in the future in terms of, uh, you know, improving uh, practices around uh, slurry spreading and fertilizer spreading and so forth. So um, maybe that's something we can pick up on again. Pat, thanks very much for your help on the questions. And I want to thank our production team, Yvonne Maher and Andy Boland, uh, for their support in the background. Uh, and uh, a reminder again that all of the information uh, that we discussed today will be available on the Chagas website. Uh, it was a recording also of today. And we will have, uh, I'd encourage you to take a look at uh, the, the resources available under the, the water quality section on the Chagas website. You've been listening to the podcast version of the Chagas Signpost series the weekly webinar that promotes and examines sustainability in Irish farming. Don't forget to join us live every Friday morning for our latest webinar. For more, visit chagas.ie. And you can also rate, review and subscribe to the Signpost series on Apple Podcasts, Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts from. I'm Mark Gibson and thanks for listening.